Welcome back to another edition of Profiles. I'm your host, Ed Hyland. Today our guest wears many hats. Jennifer McDaniel owns her own company, Sinisa Solutions, that specializes in intellectual property and product development. But she is also the Director of Special Projects at the UCF Stormwater Management Academy, as well as Director of Women's Programs in the College of Engineering and Computer Science. I want to welcome you and thank you so much for coming by. And let's start a little bit with your company for Synesis uh, Solutions. Tell us a little bit about the company and, and the subject of intellectual property. It's a, a technical consulting firm and um, I've been in corporate America for 16 years prior to starting this business. So um, under the uh, direction that I had working at Bell Labs and Lockheed Martin, I worked on lots of patents and trademarks and so since the, my company has been created, we've um, applied and, and have received two patents and 12 trademarks. Um, and that has been in conjunction with the University of Central Florida and the Stormwater Management Academy. So um, the other part of it is taking the research that is currently being done in the university as well as a consumer that has a project that they're interested in and consulting with them on how they can take it to the next step which would be to patent it to protect their intellectual property. And that's becoming tougher and tougher I understand these days because uh, you know one slight modification and, and somebody says well now it's original and I can claim it. Yes, yes it is a, it is a challenge that we're experiencing um, but it, it, there also is the encouragement of moving the idea and giving a, uh, getting a new product out there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what type of patents, what type of uh, subject material have you been working with so far? Uh, the first patent that I worked on was a three-dimensional saw, which is a surface acoustic wave device, and that was with um, SawTech, mm -hmm. which is local sure. in Apopka and the university. And the second patent is um, an international patent for water control, and that's to move water from one location to another. And it's also uniqueness is looking at environmental uh, sensors and being able to control the uh, water quality and the meteorological sensors so we know wind speed and wind direction and things like that. Water uh, obviously important to everyone and something that really just a few years ago, it doesn't seem that long ago, that it was very much taken for granted. Uh, not only our drinking water but certainly our storm water. We have storms, we have runoff. It was just something that happened in Florida. But now with the increasing population, with the concerns of the environment, it's becoming a really a very critical issue in Central Florida. I know you're directly involved with a lot of this stuff. Can you kind of give us a start here? Where where are we uh, with, with stormwater control and, and kind of dealing with, with stormwater runoff? Um, in the Stormwater Academy, we've done lots of research in the area of um, what different types of water are available. There are three types of water that are available to us. Those that come from our watersheds, um, from our aquifer, which is our drinking water. Uh, reclaimed water, which is treated uh, sewage water, gray water, they're all the same thing. And storm water, that's what we're proposing as a third water supply so that um, we can use that for irrigation. Currently, um, more than 50% of our homeowners are using drinking water to irrigate their lawns with. And we see with the uh, high demand for water, with our population growth, and with studies that we've done that have shown that um, the water supply is not getting back into the aquifer, our, our spring sheds are not getting replenished as quickly because of all the development that has been going on around our spring sheds. It's reducing that flow to get back in there. So um, the, we are running a risk of running out of water. The other thing that we've done research in that has shown that in reclaimed water alone, there's over 14 counties in the state of Florida that are exceeding their use of reclaimed water. So we found very innovative ways to use that water again. And now we're running out of that water source. So we propose stormwater as an, another water source that we can use to augment um, the water supply. And currently we've got projects that are going on on campus to put in a system, which is our control system, that chooses between reclaimed water and storm water. Of course, we would choose storm water first because it's low cost and it's available. And then we would choose reclaimed water second. And then with that, we'll be able to uh, use it for irrigation on our campus. Well, let me, because I'm not really up on all this area, okay. so hopefully I'm, I'm like a lot of folks who might have some questions about stormwater. Uh, it rains a lot in Florida. Yes. We seem to have a lot of water coming from the sky, and it's fairly obvious that we've built up a lot, so the water goes somewhere. 
uh, a question I've heard many people ask, well, where does it go, first of all? And if, if it is available to us or potentially available to us, how do we, we capture that in a way to make it usable? Um, yes, the stormwater comes down and it can go as runoff into your lakes. And you'll notice a lot of them in your communities, it'll say stormwater drain, which is telling you that, that that runoff water is going to replenish your lake that's there. And on the university campus, we are increasing our storage areas, which is increasing our stormwater ponds so that we can retain more water on campus. And that way we can reuse that water on campus. And when you reuse it, what it's doing is, is it's allowing us to replenish our aquifer faster because we are redistributing it across a wider area. And that's al allowing it to get down to the aquifer. Otherwise, if we weren't capturing this in stormwater ponds, it would be running off in the little econ. It'd be running off in the watersheds that are nearby and potentially polluting those um, watersheds. So what we're doing is we are making ponds that we are drawing the water out of, but based on water quality. You don't want to just build any pond out there because there are health concerns if you just pull the water from any pond. You do want to monitor what type of water quality that is available there. And then we're redistributing it across campus in the form of irrigation. And then it's going back down into our water supply. So we're keeping all this water supply on campus. So we're not causing any post develop any more contamination or pollution to run off a of campus. We're keeping that all in house. Would, would stormwater that would be saved and then perhaps reused, yes. uh, would it have to be treated in some fashion? Or is it, is it going to be clean enough to be able just to use in that form? Well, um, we see that through using our control system, we'll be able to determine if it does need to go through a cleaning process. And there are different processes out, out there that you can use. But for the most part, um, just letting it f refilter through our, our soil and our sand, that's going to be cleaning it as well. So um, there's not a true cleaning process like you would need if it was reclaimed water. One of the, the issues that I know keeps coming up is, uh, okay, we have storm water. It does go into our lakes. Sometimes in, in cases we're trying to, to save it in, in the storm water ponds, as you mentioned. But it would be nice if we could get water that would go into these retention areas and as runoff that was cleaner. And so there's, there's got to be some ways. Uh, we've long talked about the runoff situation from farms. Mm -hmm. But people fertilize their lawns. People put things out on their lawns. Pets put thing out, things out on the lawns. And, and all that potentially can end up in the stormwater. What kind of efforts are underway to, to try and educate us in that regard? We're doing um, some public education. And one of those forms is through digital media. And that is through. Uh, hopefully short commercials that will educate the public on being aware of potential uh, pollution concerns such as pet waste, such as um, urban development, such as using too much fertilizer. And um, through this, uh, we have created an animated character, H2O for You, um, and he is searching out problems that are occurring in our neighborhoods, and we hope to be able to use this this um, digital media to educate our public. Well, let's take a look at H2O for you, is that correct? Yes. And uh, get an idea of uh, what direction you're headed with that. Right now it's an online sort of thing, correct? Yes, it is at our Stormwater uh, website that is UCF. Um, it, you would search UCF and type in Stormwater and okay. you would come up with it. All right, well let's take a little click here, a click, a click if you will on your computer, but a little clip that we have and uh, get an idea of uh, what H2O for you is all about. I have nothing to pick it up with. Oh well, it's just a little doggy poo. And besides, it's good fertilizer. Pointless personal pollution alert. Pet waste contaminating water bodies. Raindrops keep falling on my head. But that doesn't mean my eyes will soon be turning red. The cry is not for me, cause I'm never gonna stop the rain by complaining. Gadzooks, don't they know they're contaminating their own swimming hole? Dog waste can infect humans with diseases such as salmonella and the number of parasites. <laughs> Thank you.
Decomposing pet waste also adds nutrients and lowers dissolved oxygen in the water column, causing fish kills. Poopy can be catastrophic when it gets into the water. This is a job for P3 Puppy, the canine crusader that teaches about pointless personal pollution. Being responsible with your pet waste is as easy as one, two, three. One, bring a bag. Two, clean it up. Three, dispose of it properly. Disposing of it properly means flush pet waste down the toilet, unless you're on a septic system. Put it in the garbage bag and put it in the trash or a park waste disposal box. Hire a pet waste cleanup service to remove pet waste from your yard. Now the neighborhood is clean and the water is safe to swim in. Pointless personal pollution prevented. The water is safe again. H2O for you. Evaporation begin. Raindrops keep falling on my head. But that doesn't mean my eyes will soon be turning red. The cry is not for me, cause I'm never gonna stop the rain by complaining. Now, we, while we've got a little character, a little raindrop, if you will, that's, that's educating folks, I mean, it, it's, it's a serious subject, and it's really, it's not just aimed at kids. I mean, this is something that pretty much is a broad spectrum concern, need, and, and education process. Yes, it is. And the H2O for You animated guy that you just saw, um, he's more than just an animated character. He is what we consider our seal of approval. And so what we're doing is we are testing devices um, in the academy and we are also developing new products in the academy like the controller and all of these products that we recommend and we've done research behind we're putting our H2O for you seal of approval on so that you as a consumer will know that the University of Central Florida Stormwater Management Academy has has put a lot of research into this and they recommend this um, so it's not only an animated clip to help our our children learn as well as as us learn, it's also a seal of approval and it's, it's to bring an awareness. Mm -hmm. Ideally, we would love for you to be aware of the water drop in the same type of awareness that we have today of our gasoline pumps. And we all are very sensitive to the high cost and knowing what it costs to put the gasoline in our cars and uh, we all are very aware of that. Well, that's a the water is a natural resource that we are limited in and we would love to have that same awareness with what you're doing with your water at your homes, what you're doing with your your water in your lakes and what what we're doing to contaminate the water around and how we can um, prevent the pointless personal pollution. In, in uh, I know in some countries, uh, uh, England it seems to have popped in my mind, that they actually have two areas of the house where you have the drinking water area and then which I believe is the kitchen and then other facilities in the house, the restroom and others uh, where you don't use the drinking water perhaps as much they actually have a, a gray water or a recyclable uh, a tap if you will and so they've been utilizing that. Another thing that, you've, that we have adopted from the European countries is green roofs and we are building our first green roof on campus at UCF and it's the first green roof in Central Florida. Um, it will be in the center of campus in our student union building and the, the roof portion has just been finished and we're starting to put down the media and the plants will be arriving within the next month and so you, you're welcome to come out and see the uh, green roof and what that is is it's a uh, we've taken the top of the roof and we have added plant structure to it and those plants are used to reduce global warming it's because it's got evapotranspiration that's coming off of the plants so you're releasing instead of the the heat that comes off of the tiles off your roof you're now releasing the water that's coming from the plants into the atmosphere as well um, the green roofs are also going to reduce your energy costs um, in the building and we've been partnering with the Florida Solar Institute at UCF and they're going to be making measurements on temperature gradients and then we'll be able to put a study out that will tell the homeowners and the developers what type of plants we can plant in Florida since it's different than the European countries um, and we can tell them how much savings you're going to get energy cost wise and uh, we can also tell what type of media and growth material we need so this is our 
first prototype that's going on campus. Now, has this been used successfully? I, I know it's been used successfully for, for some office buildings, but is it getting to the consumer level as well? As, or, or is this something that, you know, flat-roofed uh, buildings in a downtown, for example, might be the, the ideal medium for it? I think the first medium is with flat roofs, but there's no reason why consumers, homeowners, can't have it. Um, they currently have it over in Germany and European countries. Um, green roofs are very popular in Pennsylvania. Um, in North Carolina has one. So there's other areas within the United States that we are developing now more think, green roofs. You think Florida would be a natural for that because not only do we have more sun, but tends, I mean, you just throw something out on the ground that it tends to grow around here because <laughs> right. we have the moisture and, and, and uh, you know, the soil to do that. So right. it would see, it, why are we behind the, the, the eight ball, so to speak, in, in this area? Um, I wouldn't say it's behind. It's actually we're on the cutting edge of moving it forward. We should be first though. If Pennsylvania's <laughs> got it, we should be first. <laughs> well, um, there's a lot of design um, that goes into it awesome. and there's a lot of structure and stability and there's a lot of research mm -hmm. and we're part of the, the research and, and adding to being able to bring that product to the Central Florida area. Um, one of the other H2O4U products that we've been developing is, is an a, a automated way to keep the water supply going so it'll keep the plants alive on the roof. I was going to say, do you build a, a facility to capture storm water, uh, somehow keep the system uh, regenerating itself? It's not a facility. It's more like your common mm -hmm. cistern, the old-fashioned way. Okay, like um, a rain barrel. Yes, okay. a big rain barrel. And through that, um, our controller um, that we've developed in the academy amounts to it, and it recycles the water. So I guess I'm thinking of uh, like a biosphere or a greenhouse type of thing. No. But this is all open. Yes. Yes, it is. And um, that's why it helps reduce global warming mm -hmm. um, because it's going to help the whole atmosphere, okay. everything. We, you have many projects in many different areas, but we did want to take a little time to talk about uh, another very important project you have. And I won't say it's on the side because I know it's in the forefront oh. of your mind and, and your occupation these days, and that's talking about women in engineering. Uh, we've had guests before talking about some of the differences and trying to, to encourage more young girls to get into engineering. Kind of where do we stand and, and where do you hope to, to get the magnet that's, that's going to draw these incredibly smart and talented women into, into engineering? Well, um, we just finished um, Expanding Your Horizons, which is a program we offered for fourth grade through ninth grade girls. And they came out to campus for a day. It always happens in about the March-April time frame. So those that missed it this year, you'll have to look at our website um, and look for it next year. And what, what we're doing um, with that program is we are engaging young students, fourth through ninth grade, in hands-on activities, um, such as making electric jewelry, such as DDR, which is Dance Dance Revolution, and we're looking at the sensors and the software uh, programming that goes into making a game. So we're bringing these, these tools um, and applications that we use daily alive for the younger generation so they can see uh, what they can do with a career that's in math and science and engineering. Um, there's other, we had a Northrop Grumman brought out uh, one of their thermal imaging cameras so that you can experience what the military are using over in Iraq. And um, we had hands-on crime scene investigations. And, and so we had 15 different workshops that were all taught by women and um, allowed the girls a hands-on approach so that they could have those light bulbs go off and, and see how fun science is and that there is a creative side to science. And there's more than just doing a math problem. There is an application that's fun and, and that we currently use daily. Um, so I, I know that I've been encouraging quite a few of my students that are interested in the nursing field that there's more to nursing than just caring for an individual. There's biomedicine that's mm -hmm. out there. And when you go in and look at the biomed field, you're looking at being able to build a pacemaker that's going to help thousands of people instead of being a nurse that's only helping that one that you're caring for. So there's a big global response that once the students start to realize the bigger picture that's out there and all the opportunities that are out there, then there'll be more interest to want to go into the math and the science areas because they'll understand the application side to it. I want to talk more about the light bulbs, but electric oh. jewelry, you got to explain that to me first. <laughs> we can go backwards for a second. Well, my background's electrical engineering, so of course, uh, we put batteries along with shrink wrap, along with LEDs and resistors, and we 
hung them on our ears and so they all lit up go, and <laughs> you <Okay>. got it. <laughs> that's one it way to certainly get out and stand out in the crowd as oh, well. Oh, definitely. But, but, but I think that's a wonderful thought because you're, you're talking about things that are fun, exciting, fashion, all these kind of things. But at the same time, you see on, on one simple fun level, what potentially could be done on a more serious and, and certainly uh, intensive level as yes. they, they get into higher education. Um, when you talk about higher education, one of the things that we are looking at is more recruitment and retention for women in, the, in this area because it is a projected shortfall. Um, so what, we've, what, or what I've created is a power program. And it's called Providing Our Women Engineers and Computer Scientists Resources. And what that is, is a program that is for transfer students and freshman students, their first time on UCF campus. And um, what we're doing is we're bringing all those women um, into a program together and we're providing them tools for success. And these tools are like studying how, um, how, to, how to study, uh, stress management, uh, yoga, and good health. Um, so all the tools that you need to be successful once you've already selected the engineering and computer science field, we're providing this resource for the students as well as scholarships and different research available um, research opportunities that are available. Matter of fact, I'm fixing to take the ladies uh, rock climbing. And so it's more of a team building exercise because there are few women. Um, we do want to increase those numbers. The best way to increase the numbers is to give a student a great experience um, while they're in college that's a big recruitment tool there in itself, sharing their knowledge with others. And at the same time, allow them to become successful and to build relationships. Because a lot of times, because there's few of us and you spread us across a variety of different disciplines such as electrical and civil and mechanical, you'll wind up with only two or three women in your class. Well, bringing them together in a program like this, then you've got 255 women in a room, and then you can see that there is more power in numbers, and then you can bond together and build relationships that way. As you say, strength in numbers, it's always yes. a benefit there. Have you seen some of the attitudes change? Uh, I mean, you're probably too young to, to remember uh, some of the things that went on years ago, but I mean, it, it was not a field for girls. I mean, basically it was a, oh, boys make things. Boys are engineer types. Girls do other things. Uh, they get into the nursing field or the medical field. And, and, and if you've seen the changes, how are you going to translate that into, into a message that will be picked up by this next generation coming up? Um, I personally have seen a lot of the changes and experienced some of them myself. Um, and if you were to go today into a classroom, and we've done this study, and we've asked the students to draw a picture of a doctor, draw a picture of an engineer, draw a picture of a nurse, you get your candid male, female, and Unfortunately, when you get to the engineering, it's typically the male. Well, the only way to change that is to start the education at the younger level. Um, you've got to choose when you're in the fourth grade uh, what math and science classes you want to take and if you want to even continue taking math and science classes. And so we need to educate them at that younger level so that they are prepared to have already taken their algebra and their geometry and their calculus so that they're not playing catch up by the time they get to the university level. They're already ready to go into that direction and become a uh, engineer or a scientist. Is, is fourth grade too old? I mean, I started <laughs> recognizing that boys were boys, girls were girls at a much earlier age than fourth grade. That's a great question. And um, yes, we are finding that, that the younger ages, um, there's a definite need to start the education younger. Um, we used to only think it was 11th and 12th grade, and we have now dropped it down to at least fourth grade, and there's lots of studies that have proven that we do need to go below that, even down to your first grade um, level. So it's a different mindset. It's an uh, education process. It's developing curriculum that promotes females. It's developing books that shows females in these roles, games that are female friendly, and they don't picture women only in a provocative way, which unfortunately a lot of the gaming does today. Um, so it's really, it's a change in culture. And the only way to start doing that is to develop products and pro work on projects and get research and grants that allow us to develop a curriculum down at that level. Are, are you seeing some, some changes too in, in uh, the private sector since you have first-hand experience with that as well? Mm -hmm. um, uh, companies saying, and, and not to say this in a sexist way, but there are those occasions when someone would say, I, I would like a woman's point of view on this project. 
And are you seeing some more of that out there? Now? Most definitely. I'm also seeing from the corporate arena um, companies that are focusing funds that are geared towards K through 12 development. They are allowing more students to come into their companies and to do job shadowing and to do the take your dollar to work days. And um, I know that when I was at Lucent, uh, that was one of the programs that I championed to make take your dollar to work day a female only event. Um, a, lot of, a lot of corporations say take your child to work day. Well, there's a reason why it's daughters and it's because the women do, at their, the girls at that young lady level lose an interest in the math and science areas and so you do have to reinforce that and the best way to reinforce that is to bring them into your corporations your high-tech companies and and to let them meet women role models that are doing these jobs and see that it is fascinating and fun and there is more to it we've just got a minute or two uh -huh. left and I want to see if, if that was being built on with any additional uh, uh, incentives, scholarships, this type of thing. You're starting to see some opportunities for women, for just women, to, to perhaps uh, pick up the, the, the mantle and run. Oh, definitely. There's lots of corporations that are partnering with universities that are providing research. There's lots of internships. Matter of fact, um, one of the best ways for a child to get a summer job in a company is to participate in the science fairs. The corporations are at the science fairs, they're, they're judging the science fairs and they're looking for potential candidates to hire and um, the best, best job opportunity is to have a summer intern and um, corporations are out there looking for more women in this area. We got a chance to go out to, uh, there's an egg drop competition, which yes. the uh, Engineering Society does locally, and it was evenly split. There were just as many boys as girls, and, and frankly, the girls are doing a whole lot better job keeping their <laughs> eggs safe. Uh, they drop an egg from a, a, roughly a, a two-story uh, drop there to, to see if they can devise a, something to protect it. Right. But uh, it, was, it was nice to see all the, the young boys and girls out there uh, creating these things. You go, well, how many of them are going to be an engineer someday? It'd be nice to see. Yes. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much for coming by and joining us today and sharing uh, your insights. And uh, we'll have to have you back sometime and uh, talk you. a little bit more about uh, Stormwater and all the other projects you're involved in okay. these days. Thank you very much. And that does it for this edition of Profiles. I'm Ed Hyland. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll look for you next time.